Thank you for joining us to learn more about mental health in the retail industry hosted by Mercer. My name is David Kopsch. I lead our retail industry practice. And we've got a very special guest with us today, Ms. Renata Elias from Marsh Advisory. is going to speak to us about mental health in the retail industry, but specifically workplace and active violence. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Renata. Thank you very much, David. And it's a real pleasure to be able to speak to you all today. I think, you know, when we talk about active violence um, and workplace violence today, we're coming to the realization that really based on statistics, that there is an increase in active violence incidents. Um, because of that, organizations are adding active violence, workplace violence, to their lists of risks as far as things they need to be prepared for. This is really um, a sort of a staggering statistic. And this is as of August 17th of 2023, there have actually been 447 mass shootings in the United States. First of all, what is mass shootings? It's when four or more individuals have been killed or injured by a mass shooter. And this does not include the shooter. Why is this number staggering? Because since 2017, the number is progressively getting higher every year. Right now in 2023, we're looking to surpass 2022. And so the statistics are really staggering. Now, Renata, as we listen and see this number, yeah. can you speak more towards in, is, is it only retail industry? Is it overall? Because we know there's a lot of negative sentiment mm -hmm. going on out there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not only retail. Um, we used to, many years ago, say healthcare, schools, higher education, K through 12. But now it doesn't really matter which industry or sector it is. It can be retail. It, it can be the sports and entertainment. It can be manufacturing. There is no sole industry that is impacted. We always say now it's it can be happening at any time and anywhere. So what are the numbers telling us? And the active shooter incident report from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, for 2022 stated that there were 50 incidents in 25 states and, and D.C., so what that's really saying, it's not only um, impacting multiple across all industry sectors, but it's also impacting across all states. That there were 313 casualties. There were 50 shooters. And 13 of these, of, of the FBI statistics, were considered those mass killings. Three, and in the FBI's definition, three or more killed. So the numbers are telling us that it is, it is time that we need to all be prepared all across all organizations so that we in retail can minimize lessen the impact of these terrible events and so the staggering to mitigate what next renata well you know as as we are living in this new world um, it is really important that organizations and your employees understand what you need to do to, to minimize these impacts. And I always say you have to look at how you as an organization, number one priority is your people. How do you protect your people? How do you support them in the event of an incident? How do you protect your operations, your assets? And in the end, how do you protect your brand and reputation? Because how you respond is going to be what people remember. It's not going to be the incident itself, but how you as an organization respond. So, Renata, listening to you about these numbers, could it help us understand, maybe there's a foundational understanding of what you mean when you're speaking to incidents and violence? Absolutely. Um, when we think of workplace violence, and we think of active shooter, we, we kind of, we have some definitions. 
Um, and this really helps you on everyone understand um, so sort of what what are we, what are the different types of things we need to look at based on what the uh, definition state. So let's talk about workplace violence first. Um, and, and as OSHA states that it's any act or threat of physical violence it can be harassment, it can be workplace intimidation or other threatening disruptive behavior at the workplace. So it's not only, I always say active shooter, active violence is when workplace violence has gone wrong. When we talk about workplace violence, there's four different types. So first we have the criminal intent. So somebody walks into a business, there is no relationship with the business, they're not a customer, they're not an employee, they're just coming in to commit a criminal act. So that's type one. Type two is a customer client or patient or student. So somebody comes into a school, somebody comes into a doctor's office, somebody goes into a retail location, the customer and takes out and commits a violent act. So that's number type two. Then we have the third type of workplace violence, which is worker on worker. So you have employee that may walk into a retail location. They were terminated a week ago and they're now gonna commit a, a criminal, a, a violent act on either their fellow, former fellow colleagues or their supervisors. Um, a worker has a problem issue with another worker. They come in and bring that um, aggression and violence into the workplace. So that's number three. And then the last one, which is the type four or the personal relationship. There's a divorce, a divorce occurring. There's a restraining order in place or a custody battle in place. You'll have an ex-partner who will come into the workplace and take it out on an employee in the workplace, their former partner. Um, so these are the four types of workplace violence, criminal intent, uh, customer, client, patient, type three, worker on worker, and then number four, which is a personal relationship. Then we look at active violence. Um, and um, first of all, why do we not say active shooter? Active shooter, using a weapon, a, a, a firearm is one type of active violence. But an individual actively killing or attempting to kill people in a confined or populated area can use things other than firearms. They can also use knives or bladed weapons. They can use blunt objects. They can use a vehicle. They can use an explosive device or chemicals. So there's different ways that um, the attempted killing or or actively killing of individuals can occur. And it's important that while yes, we are seeing the majority of incidents in the United States are with firearms, that if you look at other incidents, um, even around the world, you'll see that there may be more uh, vehicles used or knives or blunt objects. So then we also look at how can you as an individual and how can your employees stay safe? We talk about situational awareness. I like to say, you know, think of an eagle and, you know, the eagle's got the, can turn the head 360 degrees. And they always know what's going on behind them. We have to think like that in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, it's also like if I say, hey, take your car and go home, but guess what? I'm going to take your rear view mirror off and your two side, rear, side view mirrors off. Try driving your vehicle without your mirrors because you're gonna lose complete situational awareness. So being aware of what's happening around you is critical, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's out and about in the community with your family and loved ones. Know your surroundings. Pay attention to what your gut is telling you, that spidey sense. You know, that I don't, there's something that's not right. Pay attention to those feelings because it's important that if you do sense something's wrong, Make sure you see something, you say something, and that you do something. And a good example is if you're in a parking lot, you notice that there is an individual, it's 100 degrees out, there's an individual in the parking lot dressed in all black, black mask on, black cap, and a backpack or duffel bag. That does, may not seem right to you. Make sure you don't just walk in and get to work. Make sure you let somebody know at your workplace, your manager or security. Again, see something, say something, and do something, David, is really important. And, and I really, I want to emphasize that too, Renata, because in the retail industry, there are so many 
frontline workers, the, whether it's interacting with customers, walking the, the, the parking areas, walking through stores, behind warehouses, cleaning, whatever that is, the, you know, in the restaurant, outside, is they are the eyes and the ears yeah. to the organization. They're the eyes and ears of and to the customers. Mm -hmm. And so being mindful, watching, listening is so critically important for these frontline workers that are out there in the retail industry. Are they uh, no, so, and I was going to say, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's part of it, those in the retail industry for, for your companies, making sure that when you're training your employees in, in the retail space, make sure that you incorporate situational awareness in your training for them. Because they said, everybody's part of a team. We all have eyes and, and we all have the ears. So it's important that they adopt that sort of mentality, that philosophy of being situationally aware. It, Renata, we heard you mention something doesn't look right, doesn't feel right. And beyond the how they might be dressed, are there any behaviors or, or watch outs for way maybe somebody is doing something that we should be watching as signs? Absolutely. Um, and a lot of times, if you look back at past incidents of workplace violence after shooter, there are a lot of times were some signs um, that people did behaviors they did notice. Um, and, and there's a variety. And, and what we're seeing now is a long, long list. Um, and just because an individual exhibits one of these doesn't mean that they're going to be a threat or they're they're, they're going to cause harm. But if you're seeing an, another employee or customer in your retail location exhibiting multiple behaviors of these, multiple of these behaviors, you know, and and it's and you know you know that if it's, especially if it's another co your colleague or an employee that this is not like them. This is the, these are things that have come on suddenly. Um, they, these are the things that you sh we should be watching for um, and, and then making sure that there is a process at the workplace for if employees are concerned or they are seeing things that give them that, oh, I don't know, this is, doesn't seem right, that they have a way of then reporting. So again, a lot of these things we do that, you know, we one of us, one of us, may exhibit those behaviors or one of those behaviors. But again, if there's multiple behaviors and this is all of a sudden a change in behavior, making sure that you have that reporting process in place um, at your organization so your retail employees have a place to go. And when we're talking about the reporting, we're talking sort of three different buckets. Um, the first bucket, if you notice any of those behaviors that we just talked about, and you see a weapon or or you see a weapon and you feel that you're in immediate threat to your life safety, you have a process to call and it should be to call 911 or your local police department. Um, so you get in the phone and then you would notify once you are in a safe place, you then notify uh, your store managers uh, st or an other management um, individual. If someone notices something and they do not feel it's an immediate threat, but they're concerned, you need to have a process in place. So who does, should that employee go to? Do they Can they go to their store manager? So report it, go speak to the store manager. Um, is there a human resources employee that they can also go to? So making sure you identify that process for employee reporting when they notice something um, such as strange behavior, but they do not feel an immediate threat. And then lastly, what about those employees at your location that notice something, they are not in immediate threat, they don't feel a threat, however, they don't, they're afraid and do not want to um, get, be, um, give their name out, they do not want to tell their store manager, they don't want to call HR directly because then now th their name, they'll know who they are. Make sure you have an anonymous reporting hotline, and um, that's really one of the sort of components of workplace violence prevention program is having a place for your employees to call when they feel uneasy, they feel something's off, um, having an anonymous 
place that they can go, 1-800 number that they can go report this anonymously. Um, I think this is these are this is really critical. So again, making sure your employees understand call 911 first if it's life safety. If there's no life safety, talk to their manager. If they want to remain anonymous, make sure they reach out to an anonymous uh, uh, hotline uh, to report it. So, Renata, you you shared some a little bit on scenarios and what if. Are there any other what ifs that maybe aren't so defined? As far as and maybe if you elaborate a bit on the question. Certainly. So, so I just so I go down the right the right path here with my answer. Well, sitting in a crowded break room. Yes. A colleague runs out yelling yes. and swearing. What if? Yeah, and that that is, you know, that and, and there you go. That that is an example of workplace violence. So what would someone do? Um making sure that whether an employee's in a crowded break room. Um, um, in the in the back stock room is out on the floor of your location, making sure that they understand what to do if somebody comes up to them who's aggressive. Could be an employee, it could be a customer. And there are little tips um, that we um, we recommend employees follow. Uh, for example, keeping your distance. So if you feel someone is is yelling. Um, and, and you don't want them right in your face. You want to keep that safe distance between you and that individual. Um, you want to put on those listening ears. Listen to what they have to say. Um, sometimes people who are angry um, are just needing somewhere to vent. And unfortunately, it may be to your employee, maybe to you. Um, so if you if you're in a feel you don't feel unsafe and you feel like you can carry on a conversation, first listen to what they have to say because a lot of times they just need to vent um try to see if you there's a solution you can find you know remove them from the area ask if they'd like to sit down if you feel that it's safe to do so um offer see if there is a option for them um as far as can you solve the problem if it's a customer who's angry um you know see what solutions there may be get your store manager involved make sure the store manager is brought in understanding those different um, uh, options of how to de-escalate an angry individual, not yelling back, not raising your voice back, keeping yourself at a safe distance, listening to what they have to say, staying calm. These are all things that really can help an individual, help your employee sort of manage through um, an angry individual. Yeah, Renata, the, the listening to you speak to these de-escalation tips in the event of violence. Mm -hmm. We always think that the violence is directly connected to a, an angry voice mm -hmm. where we looked at a scenario that said, I don't appreciate you sharing that feedback with my boss. Mm -hmm. I wasn't angry in tone. I didn't even use a poor choice of words but I clearly sent you a message that I don't like what you said or did in my direction. And so where I'm going with this, Renata, is, is could we be on the tipping point to what if we now start to hear pop, pop sounds coming from the back of our building or our restaurant we're out there on the front line. What do we do now? Yeah, and good question. And I think, and and when you do hear the sounds of pop, 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 I know the first things that come to our, our thoughts are, is that fireworks or is that gunfire? Training, what are the options? Training and understanding what an employee's options are when they do hear that pop, pop, pop is important to have that because you want to build muscle memory. You want to, your body can't go where your brain hasn't gone. And that is why training on what to do in an active shooter incident is critical for every organization, including retail. Um, understanding what run, hide, fight mean, and understanding what those three options are. 
with the first one being running um, in any type of situation where you're hearing uh, the pop, 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 you're seeing a gunman uh, with somebody with a, with a firearm. Um, and they're obviously in an active shooter situation. The number one priority we always say is if you can run, you run and you run like you've never run before. You're not running the 100 meter final, you're running the 10,000 meters. You are running to safety, to get yourself away from the line of fire, to get yourself away from the gunman. So that's what you should be doing first. But to do that successfully and effectively, you should know ahead of time in your retail location, where are, are my exits? Our human instinct is to go to the exit we came in from. Um, and so we came in through the front door, we're going out through the front door. But in an active shooter situation, that front door may not be the safest way to go. That gunman may be at the front door. So knowing where your exits are um, at work, um, when you go out into the shopping mall, when you're out um, at a restaurant, when you're in a movie theater, know where your alternate exits are. There's a reason the flight attendants on every flight when you're flying tell you that there are six emergency exits on board, two at the front, two at the back, and two over wing. Your nearest exit may be behind you. There's a reason for that because the safest exit may not be the one you came in on. So that'd be first. If you can run, it's safe to run, you run. But what if you can't run? What if you, you are you, you make a quick assessment? Um, the only way out you do have is if you were, were to run past the gunman. So then you got to look at options to hide. How do you hide? Preferably in a room that has no windows, if you can. You want to get into that room. You want to push whatever furniture you can up against the door. If you can lock the door first, ideal. Push furniture up, printers up, vending machines up, tables, chairs, stack them up against the door. Secure that door. Stay low to the ground. Silence your cell phone. Do not turn it off. Silence it so you can still push the button and call 911 and have an open line so that you're able to talk. But keep quiet and then wait for the police to arrive. So that is if you cannot run, you're gonna hide. But what if there is no place to hide and it's you can't run and the gunman is there? What are your options? This is gonna be a decision an individual, an employee needs to make and it's a split second, split second decision. But to fight and you're fighting to save your life. And how, what do we mean by fight? We do not mean you need a black belt. We mean, what we're talking about is you need to distract and disable the gunman. You need to throw things. You need to work together as a team if there's more than one of you. Throw things, chairs, bags, water bottles, fire extinguishers, garbage cans, whatever you can find, you throw it at the gunman so that you can hopefully escape and run and get out of there. Um, that is a decision that we all need to think about now. And this is again, where I go back to building that muscle memory. Your body can't go where your brain hasn't gone. Your employees, everyone needs to think, if I'm ever in this situation, I need to run first. If I can't run, I need to hide. And if I can't hide, I need to fight until I can get away and get to safety. Um, but that fight one takes um, everybody to really think about that. and. Will you be able to do it? It needs to be something that you need to think about now um, because at the time you have seconds to make a decision. So remember, run, hide, fight, understand how to use them and that you may be interchangeable. You may be hiding first and then running. You may be fighting first, then running. Um, but understand these three options and how they can save lives. You know, Renata, it's, it's scary that we have to go through and share about the, these options yes. and these organizations work with their people to prepare them for these options. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important that organizations understand that there is the incident and it happens after it happens. Can you share with us more about what organizations, you know, what happens next after yeah. the incident? Great question. Um, 
and and after the incident is is really the longest period of time for an organization. The incident will be over very quickly. Um, eventually, the police will be finished with their investigation. The media will have left. Crime scene tape will be brought down, and then it's back to the organization to pick up the pieces. So what can one expect as an organization? First of all, your retail location will be closed for a period of time. Um, and this will be while the police conduct their investigation, they process the crime scene. That may take a day, two days, five days, depending on the magnitude of the incident itself. So be prepared for that, that you will not be able to go back into the workplace. If your employees have left belongings behind, weren't able to grab their phone, keys, wallets, jackets, um, they won't be able to get access to that um, for days. So as an organization, you need to have plans in place to deal with that. The media will be on scene. Um, and we really encourage uh, companies and organizations to make sure that you have a media policy and that your employees understand what that media policy is. And generally, we, we do not want our employees to talk to the media, but we have a corporate communications representative to, that just can be contacted his number who will answer any questions. So we'll make sure you have, number one, a media policy. Number two, your employees are aware of what that is. And then... Lastly, and I will say most importantly, have a communication plan with, employees need to have a communication plan with families and loved ones. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's an active shooter incident, if it's an earthquake, if it's a wildfire, if it's um, any type of emergency situation at your location, make sure you talked about with your family, how will you contact them? A quick text message. Um, if you don't have your phone, borrowing somebody's phone so you can make a call or quick text message. Um, the hardest thing for families and loved ones to hear is breaking news on their phones that there is a shooting at a location and they know that's where you're working right now. An employee may be working. And what are they going to do? If they have not heard from you, they'll try calling, but they're not getting an answer. They're going to get in their car and they're going to go and they're going to be stopped at the police tape and they're going to be congregated. So making sure that your employees understand that it's important that they have a communications plan with their family. Um, also that you as an organization, how are you going to also communicate with your employees? Afterwards, there's going to be a lot of requests for resources. Um, there are going to be questions about, are we working tomorrow? Um, are we going to get paid? If the store is closed, our retail locate or our retail locations closed, you're going to be getting a lot of questions of the organization, making sure you as an organization have that communications plan as well for your employees. But after an incident like this, it's really important that an organization identify what resources you have available. Um, but there are going to be needs uh, for those employees. That were, that were impacted by the event, on scene at the event. You may have customers who are impacted. You will have employees' families who are impacted. You'll have other employees from other locations who are impacted. So identifying what resources you have as an organization to help those employees. Um, employees are gonna be going through various ranges of emotion. Some will, it won't impact them at all. Others will have anxiety, they won't be able to sleep, they'll be distressed. They may have been, they may have brought on a secondary trauma assault. In other words, they've had a previous incident impact them in their lives, and now this incident has re-triggered um, previous trauma. So there's gonna be different things that your employees will go through. So it's important to under, for your employees to understand that they need to know where to go. Do you have an employee assistance program? Is there on-scene, um, counselors or support, I refer to it as human services support, that can come and just help those individuals who are impacted deal with this day-to-day -day coping and day-to-day -day looking after children, making sure the kids are picked up from school, all of those things that we take for granted, but those that are impacted will not, will not have that ability to do. So again, making sure your employees understand that there are resources, um, making sure they know about these resources ahead of time, and that if it's, for example, the employee assistance program is not only for critical incidents, it can be for any type of situation where somebody needs to talk to somebody and wants to do it anonymously. 
So um, really important to make sure you have this program, th these resources in place and know that after a critical incident that you are pushing these, th these resources out to your, all of your employees to access. So to that end, Donata, what does preparedness, when we go from mental health escalating to active violence, what does an organization, what does their preparedness look like? They need to, it, it comes in a, a whole different a, a way of things. And, you know, I think when we're talking about what can an organization do to make sure you are prepared, you are resilient, you are ready. Um, uh, there's many things to make sure you're as an organization whole. Um, making sure that you, one, before an incident ever occurs, and this can be any emergency, so we're not just talking about active shooter workplace violence, any type of emergency impacts retail location, making sure you do assessments. So, number one, security is, is your physical security up, up to speed. Um, how are you as an organization from your top level, from your senior leadership team, all the way down to your employee level? Are, are, do, you, are, do you have the capabilities in place? Are people trained and exercised and aware of what their roles are in an emergency? Do you have the plans and procedures in place? Emergency response procedures, do your retail locations, do your employees know what to do if there's a fire, if there's a medical emergency, if there's a hazardous material spill, if there's an active shooter incident? What are those procedures and are, and are they aware? Do they know if they need to find them, where are they posted in your location? Making sure that managers, store managers, retail location managers, um, regional managers, corporate, man corporate management all have the training um, on how to support a location um, during after an emergency event. So making sure there's that training I can't emphasize enough about the importance of, of exercising, drilling, again, is building that muscle memory. Think about your, your senior leadership team. Do a mass casualty tabletop exercise with your senior leadership team and talk about the challenges that you may have handling your people and your communications. Those are gonna be the two big ones. Making sure you have a crisis support process in place. Do you have human services response support available? Um, again, there'll be, uh, we, one doesn't necessarily expect internally to manage that because it's a very difficult task to manage human impacts to a traumatic event, making sure you have access to those third parties, um, understanding what your claims process is in these type of incidents. And then afterwards, reviewing, you know, when things have settled down a bit and you're slowly, you know, managing, getting back to operational um, you've got making sure that your people have the resources available to them, making sure you look at uh, do a post incident debrief. What worked well for your organization? What may where are our gaps? Uh, what are the gaps needed? And then making sure that you also have that ability, because in the end, to look after our people, we need to make sure we're continuing to operate. Um, because in the end, everybody needs a job. People need to work. They need to get a paycheck. So making sure you have a continuity of operations plan so that you can continue operating um, after a traumatic uh, uh, incident, such as an active shooter incident. Renata, thank you so much for sharing with us in the retail industry about active shooter workplace violence. For more information, you can check out mercer.com to follow along with any additional insights from this webinar or any other information provided by Mercer. And thank you for attending today.